Good evening. Glad we could make it. Me too. I've got a few announcements to go over. Alan has still got COVID. I'm assuming he's still at home with COVID. It says Alan Cannon, which is Kathy Ferguson's father, fell and cracked a rib. He's still in the hospital and not doing well. Lewis Hargrove is doing better, but she's tired from from the last few days of activity. Her sister, Pat Snow, has had cataract surgery, went well, but discomforts from the swelling. Oh. Bill Story's back surgery. He is home and doing a lot better. He's home and walking. Uh, Judy Lackey is still having her that serious medication issues and they've started on some new treatment medications and uh, Brother Ivan seemed to think she's possibly a little better today and Di Diane Rabb is still at home with her leg problems uh, this morning Mike and Becky Ellett had a new grandson he was born about 4.30 this morning. His name is Beckett, and he needs prayers. He has a low heart rate. Uh, the doctor didn't seem to think it was too serious to not to send him home, so he's home to now. The men's breakfast is this Saturday at 7 in the fellowship room. Uh, Dana Grammers is still looking for some help this this coming Saturday to move if there's anyone that can help her anything else let's pray boy I've got one more I'm sorry it was under the piece of paper Margie Jones former member has breast cancer and cancer also is in her spine Please pray for her and her family. She's not doing very good with that. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, Lord, and we're so thankful for this week that you've watched over us and you've got us back here safely. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to hear our prayers with, with all of the ones that are on our prayer list, Lord, and we pray if it can work into your plans that all of them could be healed. We pray for Alan with to to get better from the COVID. We pray for Alan Cannon to be able to get over his rib, his cracked rib and be able to come home. We pray you'll continue to be with Lois Hargrove, watch over her and help her to continue to recovery as well as Bill's story. We pray, Lord, that Judy's medications will go, go well and that she can get to get better as soon, soon Lord. And we pray also that you'll be with Diane and help her with her leg problems. We pray, Lord, you'll watch over the Yelich's new grandson. We pray, Lord, that, that he <clears throat> will have good health. His mom and his dad will all be in good shape. We thank you, Lord, for, the, for his birth. We pray, Lord, you'll be with Pat and uh, after her surgery, that her on her eye, that it will go well. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with all of the VBS people that are working, the teachers and the helpers. We pray for you to, you to be with all of the, the students and the kids that are going to be here, that it can go well and that it, we can have a successful VBS. We thank you, Lord, for this country that we live in. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to come before you at times like this. We, <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that we can continue to have our freedom to worship you and our freedom of speech. Lord, of everything we have, we thank you most of all for what Jesus Christ is willing to do for us, and we ask it all in his name. Amen. Amen. Our song tonight is Because He Lives. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Um, if you're able, would you please stand? God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my 
You got me on, oh, I'm on now. I can turn this one off. Okay, well, as they say, the speaker of the hour needs no introduction. And with the crew that we have here tonight, he doesn't want an introduction. <laughs> Some of you guys just tell it like it is. <laughs> All right, we are in our summer series um, that uh, began back the, the, the first part of uh, June. In fact, tonight, about halfway through my talk, we'll be exactly halfway through this year's summer series. It is a summer series that, that deals with great lessons from great memory verses. And I have to admit that I'm, I'm a little, not 100% happy with, with the way that it's gone up to this point. That's probably more my fault than anybody else's. But it seems like there's sort of a, uh, an idea that I'm just going to preach on my favorite memory verse, and that wasn't really what I asked anybody to do. Uh, and I don't know of a preacher that has a favorite memory verse. You know the old Aggie joke, what do you do to drive an Aggie engineer crazy? Put him in a round room, tell him to sit in the corner? Yeah, well, <clears throat> put a preacher in a room full of memory verses and say, go sit by your favorite one. Yeah. There ain't enough chairs. Different times, different studies, we see things different ways, and I, I was really hoping that we would get a lot of insights on things that maybe we hadn't always thought about, but maybe I didn't communicate that as, as well as I would like to have. As the, the, the passages came into me and I started putting it together, I could kind of see where this was going to go, and it, it, um, uh, I, I was hoping for a little bit more, but that's just me. Uh, you know Galatians 2 verse 20 I've been crucified with Christ no longer he that not me but Christ who lives in me you know 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified you know Matthew 7 21 through 24 not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will in the kingdom of heaven but he does will of my father who is in heaven and you know uh, Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 rejoice the Lord always and again I say rejoice let your forbearing spirit be made known all men the Lord is near you know Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and, and and you know Hebrews 12 1 and 2 let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily besets us and run with endurance the race that's set before us and uh, you, you know Hebrews 10 24 and 25 uh, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and 
and not forsaking the assembly as is the habit of some. And you know, Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And I was, I was really hoping that, that, that more guys would step out and, and talk about the things that you haven't read since you were in Mrs. Johnson's third grade Bible class. That there would be some, and, and there's, there's been some that have done that. I am really interested to see what the brother is going to say about Mark chapter 2, 27 and 28, where Jesus says, I'm, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That's going to be an interesting conversation. I'm not going to give Lonnie's away, but Lonnie's picked a passage that I don't think anybody else would choose for a memory verse. But as he explained it to me, there's, there's something in there that really motiv motivates him and challenges him, and that's kind of what I'm hoping for. And I'm pretty sure that most people would not have picked the verse that I chose from Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. But let me set the scene for the verse before we get into the verse. It begins with Saul being obedient to the gospel in the city of Damascus of Syria. And being excited after he becomes a Christian, Saul begins to do exactly what the Lord told him to do on the road to Damascus. The Lord told him, you will bear testimony to me before kings, before the Gentiles, before the Jews. And he sets out to do that immediately, but uh, he finds it pretty tough going immediately. Uh, the Christians in Damascus are rightfully uh, concerned about him and, and regard him with a little bit of apprehension and suspicion. And the Jews of Damascus, knowing why he came, feels that he's a traitor and a turncoat. Before you know it, he has to escape by basket over the wall and, and, and lucky to get out of there with his life then he goes to jerusalem and wants to uh do some good for the lord in jerusalem and finds the experience is not any better and so uh, they get him out of jerusalem before he gets killed and, and he goes to the city of his birth tarsus and there we sort of lose track of him for a couple of years but as the church grows and it reaches the ears of the elders of the church at jerusalem that uh, there is now a church in Antioch of Syria. They just determined to send some people there to encourage them. One of those is a guy by the name of Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. And Barnabas takes a little detour on the way to Antioch of Syria. He swings up by, by Tarsus of Cilicia and finds Paul and brings him with him to do the work in Antioch. And the text says they stayed there for about a year and won many souls to the Lord. Well, about that time, after about a, a year's work together, a, a prophet by the name of Agabus comes and reveals to them that there is going to be a famine throughout the world. That would be the Roman Empire. And it's going to happen in the reign of the Emperor Claudius. And so the brethren at Antioch decide that they are going to, as they had the means, take up collection and uh, send it to the saints in Jerusalem so that they'll be able to bear up when times get hard. And they send it by way of Barnabas and Saul. When they leave Jerusalem, they bring back with them Barnabas's cousin, John Mark. And that brings us then to the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 12, the text says in verse 2 that the Spirit wanted them, the church at Antioch, to set aside for a specific work Barnabas and Saul that worked to be to take the, the gospel to the Gentiles. And so with John Mark in tow, they go down to Seleucia, which is about 10 miles away, a coastal city, and there they get passage to a ship that takes them to the island of Cyprus, and they begin on the east side at the port city of Salamis, and from there all the way across to the western port of Paphos, they are going from one synagogue to another to another, proclaiming the gospel. Now, that is not a violation of what the Spirit set them apart to do because Jesus said to the Gentiles, to kings, and the Jews. And so they're doing this, and this pattern that they establish of going synagogue to synagogue is something that Paul will stick with throughout uh, his career as a missionary to the Gentiles. <coughs> Excuse me. At Paphos, Luke tells us about the first Roman or Gentile convert that we know of for Saul, that is the proconsul, a man by the name of Sergius Paulus, who believed and was obedient. After that, the text says that they left uh, Paphos and uh, made their way by sea to Asia Minor, 
and they make uh, landfall at a place called Perga in Pamphylia. And two things happen along the way or shortly after they get there. One of them is now that Saul is no longer in a predominantly Jewish circle of influence, but rather in a Gentile circle of influence, he's going to go from his Hebrew name Saul to his Roman name or Latin name Paul, and that's how he will be identified throughout the rest of Scripture. The other thing that happens is that John Mark decides this is not for him, and so he leaves and returns to Jerusalem, and now it's Paul and Barnabas working together, and they make their way north from Perga, no indication of any work done there, but they make their way north to Antioch of Pisidia. There are about 16 Antiochs in the first century world. Two of them are mentioned in this same book by Luke, and this is the second one. So the church in Antioch of Syria now has missionaries in Antioch of Pisidia. And as is the custom, they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath and they preach. And what Luke does is record for us the first of the two sermons that he tells us that Paul preached. He tells us about two of the sermons that Peter preached. One's Acts chapter 2, the other one's Acts chapter 4. He'll give us two sermons of Paul here in Acts chapter 13 and the other one in Acts chapter 17. And that sets the stage for where we're at. Paul uh, and Barnabas have come to the synagogue. The synagogue officials, have, having had the law read and had the prophets read, say to them, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say it. And that's exactly what Paul gets up to do, to give an exhortation. And he begins where he always begins with the history of the Jewish people. He's going to talk about some of the very same things that the Apostle Peter had said on the day of Pentecost. But he comes to this statement in verse 36, For David, after he'd served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. Now I got a little pushback for that verse. Why do you want to preach a sermon about David dying and his body rotting in gray? Well, that's not the part of the sermon, the, the part of the verse I want to preach on. Everybody's going to have that, but that's not the point of the verse. The verse is after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, these things happened. And 40 years ago, a man was teaching a class on the book of Acts, and I was sitting in his class, and he made a comment about that verse I've never heard before, and I've liked that verse ever since. And so, yeah, this isn't your ordinary third grade Bible class memory verse, but there's some good stuff in this verse. I hope you get as excited about it as I have been for the last 1,900 years. First of all, we need to know something about the word purpose. You can write the word purpose there, and, or you can write the word plan there. It means the same thing. They're interchangeable, in fact, even in the New American Standard, the same Greek word will be translated purpose one time, plan the other. We're talking about the same thing. It's a word that basically approaches it, the, 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 the problem from two different sides. On the one hand, it involves the planning stage of a thing accomplished, the inward deliberation. Maybe tomorrow over breakfast you're sitting there talking with your beloved and you say, you know, I've never seen the Northern Lights, I've always wanted to. This winter, I'm going to go to Sweden, or I'm going to go to Finland, and I'm going to look at the northern lights. And guys, if it's you saying that, your wife is going to say, or are you going to be back in time for the kids showing up for Thanksgiving and Christmas? What's your plan? You had the money to do this? You're going to take extra vacation? What about this, and what about that? And, and guys, you better have a good plan, or you're not going to get to go, Right? That's, that's part of anything that we purpose to do. We, we put a plan together. Your house is falling apart. Your wife says you need a bigger house. Well, well you can't just run down the lumber yard and get a truckload of, of wood and come back home and, and the house shows up. Even if you bring in 20 or 40 truckloads of wood, it's still not going to show up. You, you've got to have a plan. You've got to go hire an architect. You've got to say this is... This is the dimensions of the property. This is the layout. He's going to say, well, this is what the city codes are. A surveyor's got to come out and make sure everything's on the up and up and the flow's going the right way and all sorts of plans are drawn up and a building contractor's going to hire somebody to oversee the construction and there's a plan for every phase of it. We understand that. So when you read this word in the New Testament, it implies the planning stage for the thing that is to be accomplished. If you and I are planners, 
it's because we were made in the image of God. And God is a planner. Uh, planning can be both good and bad. You can plan for good things or you can plan for bad things. Uh, th there are people that are, that are <laughs> probably at this very hour planning to do some terrible thing. That's just the way of the world that we live in. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The 50th chapter of the book of Genesis opens up with a statement that Israel, now Jacob's name has been changed by God to Israel, Israel died, and he dies in Egypt. He and his family have come to Egypt, and there they have stayed, and there they have been sustained, but he dies. And the text says that the Egyptians embalmed his body. It took them 40 days to embalm his body, and the text also says they mourned him for 70 days. Now, I assume that that's 40 days of embalming plus another 30 days of mourning after that, but it might have been 40 days of embalming and then 70 days of mourning. Either way, there was a whole lot of mourning going on. And after all of that is done, then Joseph reaches out to Pharaoh and says, I need to take my father's body back to Canaan. He's requested to be buried in the cave that he dug for his own burial, and I need to go. And Pharaoh says, you got my permission. Well, doesn't, it's not just Joseph that goes, but every one of the descendants of Jacob that had all come down to, to, to uh, Egypt, they go back as well. Not only that, but there is an honor guard that Pharaoh sends of Egyptians. And all the important people of Egypt and all the prominent people in the government, they all go. Can you imagine being a Canaanite out there working in your pasture and you look up and you see a host of people uh, with a military guard coming through and you're wondering what in the world is going on? Oh, they're coming to pay their last respects. And they get to the grave and they stay there and mourn for another seven days. Then everybody comes back to Egypt. And after they get back to Egypt, Joseph's brothers start thinking about things. Maybe, maybe Joseph has just been a little more sly than we anticipated. Maybe he's just been waiting until the time is right. Now that dad's gone and all the official mourning is gone, maybe now he's going to get his revenge. And they're worried about that. And so the text says that they sent a message, a message to Joseph asking for forgiveness. And that wasn't good enough. Then they went and made a personal appearance to Joseph and asked for forgiveness. And in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, Joseph said, And as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You meant evil against me. I didn't accidentally fall into that abandoned well. And, and, and while I was down there, it wasn't that a band of, of slave traders just showed up and said, here's this guy, there's nobody around him, doesn't have a name tag on his shirt. In fact, I, I can't even see his shirt. Let, let's just grab this guy and make a little money off of him. He didn't accidentally wind up in a, in a prison in Egypt. He didn't accidentally rise to become the second most powerful man in the entire empire of the Egyptians. Everything that happened to him happened in part because his brother's meant evil, planned evil against him. He says, but God planned good. You planned to put me to death, and, and God planned for me to spare your life. And that's what happened, right? So it can be good or bad. In Genesis chapter 49, just back up one chapter, Jacob hadn't quite died yet, but he's about to. He's on his deathbed. And he calls together his, his sons, and he's going to give each of them a prophecy and, and, and a blessing a prophecy about the future, most are pretty good, some eh, not so much. For instance, when he speaks about Simeon and Levi, it's not very flattering. Here's what he says to them. Let my soul not enter into their counsel when they plan. Let not my glory be united with their assembly because in their anger they slew men and in their self-will they lamed oxen. When Simeon and Levi get together and put their heads together, they feel like they've been wrong. Boy, they take action, and, and, and they're never interested in just getting even. They want to go beyond that. And you know the things that they did and just how far they took it. Jacob said, you have my, 
don't have my blessing when you do things like that. I'm not, my, my spirit's not with your spirit when you enter into council. You can't say, well, you know, I, if dad were here, I know the dad would do the same thing that we're doing. Jacob says, no, I wouldn't. Let not my glory be united with their assembly because they did things by self-will. And that may come into play as we go a little further into. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, of course, is, is a completely different story. Here God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to the people who were in exile. Jeremiah himself didn't go into exile, but he sends a message to the people who were in exile. Now, how do you think it got there? And the answer is it got there by others who, who were going to go into exile. And while they are in, busy looking for people to explain to them why we're here in exile and, and how long before we can get out of here and they're being told any day now something's going to happen you're going to get to go home god's not going to leave you here the message of jeremiah 29 is oh yeah you are going to be here i said 70 years and you're going to be here for 70 years but it's not going to be the end i know the plans that i have for you declares the lord plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope that means that even while they're in captivity god is going to sustain them and god is going to make them and their children another generation to come ready to come back and have what he has in mind for them so planning is a part of what it means purpose and it can be a good thing or a bad thing the other side of the of the coin though is that it involves the final result of the planning stage. So when you and I plan to do things, sometimes it works just the way that we planned it, and sometimes it doesn't work that way at all because there are things that we couldn't foresee, things that we couldn't anticipate, things that were beyond our control, or things that we could have known about but we just didn't, could have thought about but we just didn't. And sometimes we just have to abort the plans or, or maybe change the plans doesn't work that way with God when God plans and purposes what he plans and purposes comes to pass that's the thrust of what Paul is saying to the Jews in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia Isaiah chapter 44 Isaiah is about 150 years before Jeremiah and at the time that Isaiah is uttering his prophecies about dark things that lie ahead, the people who were hearing them were probably shaking their head and saying, that poor fellow, I can't believe that he thinks this is actually going to happen or that's actually going to happen. Doesn't he know who we are? Doesn't he know that we are children of Abraham? Doesn't he know that, that this city will never fall and this temple will never be destroyed? And Isaiah is making all these dire predictions and people are probably questioning and wondering everything that he says. And in Isaiah 44, uh, we have this statement in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the web, from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. God said, I did all these things. I didn't need your help. You weren't even here when I did these things. But I did all these things, and, and to you in particular, I am your Redeemer. You exist because I formed you in the womb. Now, you need to know that because the backdrop of the chapter is they're so busy involved in idolatry, they hadn't got time for God. And they have invented gods, and they have invented by their own imagination the images that these gods would look like, and then they have become reliant upon these gods for everything and credit these gods for everything that's going on. And they've forgotten all about God. And so God has to say, here I am. I'm your Lord. I'm your Redeemer. I'm the one who formed you in the womb. You live on this planet. You live on this earth because I made all this stuff without any of your help. And I'm the one who causes the omens of the boasters to fail. You're asking for an omen, but you're not asking the prophet of God. I'm the one that makes fools out of the diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness now what ought to be happening is you ought to be saying well you know i went to this guy and i paid him the divination fees last week and he told me something's going to happen and it didn't 
And I had gone to him a month before to pay him the definition fees, and he told me something was going to happen, and it didn't. But tomorrow, he'll get it right, so I'll just bring him some more definition fees, and this time he'll get it right. No, he's not. It's not who you put your trust in. But you haven't put your trust in God. Then he says in verse 26, confirming the word of his servant, that would be the prophets, and performing the purpose of his messengers. When a prophet like Isaiah or Amos says this is going to happen, it will happen. I'm going to make it happen. It is I who says to Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins again, and I can promise you there were people that heard that and scratched their heads and said, what in the world is he talking about? We're already living in Jerusalem. We're living a good life right now. Why, this town's been around ever since David took it from the Jebusites. And Solomon built the, the temple of the Lord here in Jerusalem. It doesn't get any better than this. God's never going to let this city go. Well, in about a hundred so years from now, they're going to see something they never imagined in their lifetimes. It's going to happen. But notice in verse 26, God has the power to confirm the word of his servant, to perform the purpose of his messengers. There is going to be a time when Jerusalem is in such ruins and un uninhabitable. Your descendants are going to sit there in captivity and shake their heads and mourn and say, those days are gone and they're never coming back. God says, yeah, they are. We're going to rebuild Judah. We're going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. It's going to happen because I said that it's going to happen. Now, here is the God who said, I built the whole world, didn't need anybody's help who is now going to do some things, but he is going to use people. People are going to be God's instruments. They're going to act according to, what's that word in Acts 13, 36? According to the purposes of God. So I asked myself, how many were used to serve the purposes of God concerning the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the destruction, the rebuilding, and all that, that this passage states or implies. I wonder how many were used by God to accomplish his purposes. I don't know what the answer is, but I came up with a with a with at least a, a partial list. He certainly used Isaiah to forewarn that this is going to happen, why it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, how it's going to end. People can forevermore look back and say, yep, God said it through Isaiah. It happened exactly the way Isaiah said it. Isaiah must be a true prophet of God. And the same thing would be true of the prophet Amos. The sixth chapter of Amos is all about what's going to happen to Jerusalem, how it's going to be destroyed, and how it's going to be rebuilt. God certainly used Nebuchadnezzar to be his instrument to bring all this stuff about. And there came a time in Nebuchadnezzar's life when he became so proud, he thought, I had done all this, and I am a self-made man, and there is nobody greater than me. And, and God put him through a little ordeal, and he came out on the other side of that and had with a little different attitude, did he not? And then there's Jeremiah, who is going to be the one to say, it's too late for the nation. <laughs> Everything Isaiah said was going to happen is happening as we speak may not be too late for you if you repent, but it is too late for the nation. And then there was Daniel that God appointed to be his prophet to work with people like Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Darius, those Gentile leaders who had charge and the care of his people, and he used them to orchestrate and bring about the things that, that, that brings this prophecy into fulfillment. And then there is this, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, there's Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the prophet that works with the people in captivity while Daniel is working with the leadership in captivity. And one of Ezekiel's jobs is to say, unpack your suitcase and go find a realtor and buy some property because you're here for the generation. You're here for 70 years. But it's also Ezekiel who will talk to them about a vision where he sees a valley filled with dry bones, ruin beyond any hope until God begins to work and bones are reconnected sinew by sinew and muscle tissue by muscle tissue and God brings back to life that which everybody looked at and said, graveyard dead, no hope. Jerusalem's coming back. Judah is coming back. 
because things are going to happen if God purposed for them to happen. Then there's Ezra. When uh, Cyrus, who was predicted by Isaiah to be the Persian king that would let them return, when Cyrus did exactly that, Zerubbabel becomes appointed as the governor of the first group of exiles to go back, and Ezra goes with him as God's prophet, as God's priest, the one who knows the law of God and teaches the law of God to everyone in Israel. And then there is Hanani. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. He's mentioned twice in the Bible. You know who Hanani is, right? Han yes, you do. Hanani was in that first group of exiles, went back with Zerubbabel, went back with Ezra. And when he gets there, things are just as Isaiah said they were. I mean, it's a mess. It's in ruin. And for a long time, when they get back, things stay that way. Enemies don't want them to prosper, and life is miserable. When Hanani left captivity to go back, he left family members behind. And one of them was a brother. You know Hanani more because of his brother than by anything else. He has a brother who serves the king in the capital city of the Winter Palace of Susa, a guy by the name of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah gets a report from Hanani about how bad things are, and that sets in motion all that takes place in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Everything that God said would happen in prophet Isaiah is now happening and then there's Artaxerxes whom Nehemiah petitioned to explain what was going on and Artaxerxes with a stroke of a pen as the king uh, gets all the materials that he needs to make it all happen that's just a partial list that I could think of uh, in a few minutes time of people that God used to fulfill his purposes and what God wanted to happen happened God's purposes are always accomplished. So when, when Paul is preaching this sermon to these Jews in Antioch, and he's talking about all these things, and he's talking about David, and he says, after he'd served the purpose of God in his own generation, I'm telling you, there were some folks in there who were nodding their heads and saying amen because they knew everything he said was right. And they were told to give a word of exhortation and boy that's exactly what he's doing and I'm telling you the people who heard it were not tired were not sleepy hadn't got to the end of the day they couldn't wait to get home they were sitting there on the edge of their pews and they were excited in fact the text says when the service was over they wanted to come back and speak to him about again the next week and they did that so let me give you three things about this verse real quick number one it states that David foretold the resurrection of Jesus now, I know you don't see it exactly stated explicitly in the verse, but what's the first word in verse 36? For. If a sentence begins with for, you can take the word for out and put the word because in. It doesn't change anything. If a sentence begins with for or it begins with because, what do you know? Not much. What you know is that whatever he's about to say has something to do with something that he's already said. A foundation has been laid. Now we're going to get some enlightenment on it. What foundation was laid? In the previous verse, Paul says that David was not speaking about himself when he spoke about not undergoing decay. What he quoted was Psalm 16 and verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. That's the word for death nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. By the way, for 50 points, that's exactly what Peter had said on the day of Pentecost when he preached his sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem. These two men preached sermons about 12 years apart, thousands of miles from one another, but they're both saying the same thing. I don't want to get out here and get radical, but it's almost like God has a plan. It's almost like inspired writers say what God wants them to say. And so Peter makes exactly the same point on the day of Pentecost that, that Paul makes to these people here. It, it excited and it stirred up the people on the day of Pentecost. It does the same thing in Antioch of Pisidia. Backing up to Peter's sermon, Peter said, verse 29, Brethren, I may confidently say to you, here's sarcasm, 
I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Well, duh. Yeah, if you can stand out there and lean against somebody's tombstone, you can say so-and-so's dead. And that's what he's saying here. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of his descendants on his throne, he, that is David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. As Peter gets to this point in his sermon, I'm telling you folks, we're on their tiptoes. Everybody's leaning forward with excitement. They don't know where this is going, but everything he said confirms the prophets. And there's a spirit of anxiety because they're guilty of what they've done and hope because they want God to forgive them. The second thing about this verse is that it states that David was used by God to carry out the will of God. And David's just one of many people that God has used since the foundation of the world to carry out his will. He's always used the agency of men to tell others about his will. And so David is just one in a long line of people that God uses. Did David understand during his lifetime all the ways that God's going to use him? Of course he didn't. And you and I can't either. But if you're still awake, let me ask you something. Think back on your life. Can you see God's purpose and things that have happened in your life in the past? Sure, sure. And I don't know that David knew everything. In fact, I know he didn't know everything that was going to happen. But he did let himself be used. And that brings us to the third statement. In the lifetime that God gave to him, he allowed himself to be used as God willed by being a servant. Did everybody in his generation have the same mindset? No, they didn't. So I think the key in the verse is that he served the purpose of God in his own generation because that's what he chose to do. Now, in the New American Standard, which is what I always have on the screen unless I say otherwise, there's a marginal note before the word served. And anytime you see a number in the New American Standard text in the middle of a verse, it means that there's an alternate reading. There's another way to translate something. And you may or may not find it to be helpful. So I always go take a look at the marginal note. And in this instance, the marginal note said you can translate it this way. For David served his own generation by the purpose of God. Now, you might look at those two and say, well, it's two ways of saying the same thing, but it's not. There's a significant difference in those two ways of rendering the passage. And uh, make sure that you see that. Did, did he just serve his own generation by the purpose of God? He certainly did serve his own generation according to the purpose of God. Did his generation need deliverance when the Philistines had Saul uh, on one side of the valley and they had their champion a giant by the name of Goliath did, did Israel need deliverance and did God provide it in a little shepherd boy by the name of David and from that point going forward over and over and over again as we look at the life of David we see that, that God is using David in specific ways in his generation and for his generation time and time again he brought them deliverance time and time again he demonstrated the, the might of God when God would give him a victory. Uh, did he set things up so that the, the, the nation would be a better nation? Did he not establish peace at least to, among the 12 tribes? Sure. He served the purpose of God in his generation, but did he serve future generations as well? See, depending on how you translate that passage, it may just be talking about what he did for his generation, or it could be that he did other things for other people. And he did do other things for other people, even beyond his generation. Did he not? Did he make provisions for the one that would replace him? On his deathbed, when, when the politics of the day were trying to, to change the outcome, he said, no, nope, Solomon is going to be the king. 
Did he make provisions for the temple that was going to come? God said, you can't build it. Your son Solomon will build it. But did David make preparations for it? He, he's not going to live to see it built. He's not going to live to see it completed. Uh, but while he's still king, while he still has the ability, doesn't he begin to make the contracts? Doesn't he begin to bring in all the raw materials? When the temple is finally going to be dedicated and the, and the worship service goes on, it's David who had organized the priesthood into 12 divi or 24 divisions or concourses and set their schedule. It's David who wrote many of the psalms that would be sung in the temple that he would never see. It's David who made the provisions for the choir, for the musicians, for the very instruments that would be played, for the songs that would be sung, and who would sing the songs. And so just on little surface stuff like that, David was constantly serving the purpose of God even beyond his generation. So I think the answer is both, and I think the New American Standard got it right in the main text, and the marginal reading in this case, I think, does us no good. The American Standard Version, is that what you got with you tonight, Lonnie? The American Standard Version, is that what you got with you tonight? It's what you got with you. 1901 says, after he had in his own generation served the counsel of God. Well, the word counsel means the same thing as the purpose or plan of God. So I think that's the right way to understand it. Plus, we don't have to guess because we have an inspired commentary. Back up to verse 21, talking about Saul. Paul said, Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. Why was he on the throne for 40 years? God's purpose. Why did he get off the throne? Well, an unfortunate uh, mishap in the battle, fortunes of war, things just turned the wrong time the wrong way, and next thing you know, Saul finds himself isolated and things are getting bad, so he falls on his own sword, you know, it, just the way it turned out. Nope, it's not the way it turned out. It's the way God purposed. Uh, he was put in by God, and then he, verse 22, is removed by God. And God raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man of, after my heart, who will do all my will. Well, of course, that's the thing that grabs your eyes, does it not? That's what we know about David. He's the man who did God's will. Why? Because, first of all, he gave his heart to God. It's not genetics. It's not DNA. It's not that some have it and some don't. David purposed. David planned to give his heart to God. And then God used David for God's purposes. I don't know, but I, I, I think there could be a sermon in there somewhere. And I think it's what we ought to think about. How are we allowing ourselves to be used? And so before we end the, question, the, the lesson tonight, how can we do what David did in his generation? Well, can we even know the purposes of God for our life and our lifetime? You might want to say no, but you probably ought to say yes. <laughs> we certainly don't know what the future is. We can't anticipate everything else. James makes a big deal about that. James says when you go and plan to do something, let's go ahead and make the plan, but then you end your plan by saying, if the Lord will, because we don't know the future. But we can know the purposes that God has for us in our lifetime. We're never going to get a prophetic utterance. Nobody's going to come in the door next week and say, I'm a prophet of God, and thus says the Lord. That's not happening. We no longer live in the age of prophets. We can do what Jesus taught us to do, pray your will be done. But in order for you to pray your will be done, you have to have the heart that backs up that prayer that you want to have a heart for God. What good does it do to end every sermon and to end every prayer with I will be done if you and I say, nope, I know that's what the Bible says, but I'm not going to do that. See, that's, that's a little bit two-faced, isn't it? That's becoming more arrogant like Saul than it is humble like David. 
we can decide to do God's will as it has been revealed to us. And has God's will for your life and my life been revealed to us? Yeah, it's called the New Testament. And over and over and over in those letters, God has prophets like uh, and, and prophets and apostles like Luke, like Paul, like John, like James, like Jude, like Peter, to say this is how you live the life of a Christian. This is what you say. This is what you do that makes you pleasing to God. You know that passage that we talked about Sunday morning, Second Peter chapter one, verses five through ten, where Peter says, "Now make all diligence to." To uh, supply to your faith moral excellence and knowledge and faith and all those eight things that he talks about there and then he gets down to verse 8 and he says for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they render you neither useless nor unfruitful God has a plan for you and a plan for me and if we are working with God, if our heart's in the right place, if we have a will to do his will, he will use us. And we won't be disqualified as useless. And we won't be of no value because we can't bear fruit. If you want to do God's will, you will bear fruit in his kingdom. It's not about waiting for an epiphany. It's just about doing what he said to do. And if we do that, and this is the part that fascinated me about the verse. The guy teaching the class reads the verse, talks about it just a little bit, a lot less than I did, and said, now, brothers, that's what you want to have on your tombstone. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. But that's right. If you and I understand what David understood and have a heart for God the way that David had a heart for God, the greatest thing that could be written on your tombstone is not what a good man or a good woman you were or how much your kids or your spouse loved you. The greatest thing about you that could be said is in your lifetime, in your generation, you served, you accomplished the purpose of God. That's not a bad epitaph. Well, I said three things about the verse, but you know me. Yea, verily, there is a fourth thing I want you to see from this verse. It's possible if we had the right heart to serve God's generation, to serve God's purposes in our generation. And Paul gave examples of people who did and people who didn't. We talked about King Saul and we talked about King David. But here's the thing. It's only possible while we're alive. It all ends at the grave. None of us on the other side of the grave are going to get a second chance, a do-over. We're not going to be able to say then, now I get it, Lord, now I understand. If you'll just send me back, I'll do better. No, now is when he wants us to accomplish his purposes. Christ is the only one whose purpose continues beyond the grave. For everyone else, it ends. The bodies that God gave us to serve him, they rot, they undergo decay, just as Paul said happened to David. Let's end it this way. Paul's prayer to the church of Thessalonica. To this end, we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith and power.